I grew up in a poor family. My dad was a gambler, womanizer, and he left us uh, when I was 18 months. I have two elder sisters, plus uh, the uh, political instability in Indonesia. That's why we often felt um, insecure and uh, a lot of fear and anxiety. So at the age of uh, 20, I met a Singaporean uh, businessman. He said that he fell in love with me and he wanted to marry me. So I got married uh, six months after uh, we met each other. Six months later, I got pregnant. And because he wants the baby to become a Singaporean, so that's how I came to Singapore 23 years ago. The first time when I came to Singapore, when I walked um, Orchard Road from the beginning to the end, to me is freedom. It's a freedom that uh, we as a minority uh, Chinese in Indonesia uh, don't get because we don't walk on the street, we don't uh, take public transport, uh, we don't even play outside, uh, especially for my, my family because we are all uh, women and there's no one to protect us. So when I walk on this on an orchard road uh, in Singapore from the beginning to the end, to me it's like, wow, you know, this is freedom. When Joelle was born, the second day, uh, the doctor uh, detected some abnormality. On the fifth day, they concluded that uh, Joelle had uh, Williams syndrome. Williams syndrome is kind of um, um, Down syndrome uh, that is uh, lacking in the um, in the chromosome in the gene. So um, and also because uh, her ventricle is very thick preventing the blood and the energy circulation to go to the upper part of the body. So um, she, also, she also developed uh, brain damage and uh, she also has uh, three holes in her heart. And she is also a hemophilia carrier because uh, her father is a hemophilia. The doctor say that she will not live past uh, three months. I, I cannot accept it because um, I was born in a in a in, in a family that is uh, I, I was I was not happy as a, as a child, and uh, when I got married, I hoped to be able to build a happy home, a happy family on my own. But then, where does the three holes in the heart come from? Where does the brain damage uh, come from? Where does the Down syndrome uh, come from? I couldn't accept, and I, I and and I find that uh, life is just so unfair for me. And when uh, we celebrate uh, first month, the father told me that uh, I think we are not meant for each other. I think we have to uh, separate. I, I was totally shocked because uh, this was the last thing that I ever thought will happen to me. I mean, now we got married and uh, we have a child and the child is so sick. And because of that, uh, I cannot go back to Indonesia. And uh, the father said that we are not meant for each other. I kept asking, what do you mean by we are not meant for each other? Is there anything that I could make up? You know, is there anything that I can do, I can change? But uh, he said that we are just not meant for each other and he left the next day without saying anything, without leaving anything behind. I was uh, puzzled uh, for months uh, that uh, why my my marriage has to end this way because uh, prior to coming to Singapore, everything was perfect, everything was good, and I was happy, and uh, I did not uh, sense anything wrong uh, with uh, my marriage. But then, uh, why out of uh, you know sudden things happen in this way so quietly? I book a ticket leaving Joel uh, behind. So I stepped into the house, I opened the door and I saw there's another woman there. A woman uh, living in my house, um, sleeping on my bed and my heart breaks. I just thought that perhaps uh, they're happier without me. I just ran outside and I um, stopped a taxi and I make a detour. I went back to uh, Sukarno Hatta, uh, the airport, and I just sat there and I rebooked my air ticket and just sat there and cried and cried. And finally, I found out a reason, a true reason why he said. 
things does not work out in our marriage. I came back to Singapore and uh, all hope is gone. I was too ashamed of myself. I was too ashamed to even tell my mother we're still in Medan. Because uh, uh, to me, you know, I left, I left Medan with high hope that um, I'm going to be um, well-to-do. I'm going to uh, marry a businessman and um, I'm going to make it in life. And, you know, building my own uh, family, I'm going to be happy. But uh, when things happened, uh, not in a way that I thought, it is too shameful for me to go back to Medan. It is too shameful for me to even uh, tell my mother about all the bad things that happened to me because I saw how my mother suffer uh, raising the three of us up single-handed. She has to work, you know, and then she has uh, to deal with uh, being um, uh, um, no, 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 no husband at such a young age being bullied by neighbors and friends and relatives and I, I, I grew up saw her suffering so uh, to me the, the last thing that I want to do is to break these names to her so um, there's no way out there's no money no friend I'm, I'm not able to speak English and um, it's in a foreign land that I know not of the culture the people the language so uh, there's no way out for me. So I thought the only way is to end it. I plan to jump down from uh, 14th floor in the apartment where I, 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 I stay. But uh, God has a better, God has a higher way for me. At that point of time, uh, all that I felt right here was painful. The pain of betrayal. It has became physical, that pain, you know, that even when I breathe, it's, it's painful. I count uh, every second of the day. I was in a severe depression. I, I don't sleep for five days. I can do it for five days. I wrote a letter to my mother to say that I'm sorry I cannot send money. I cannot, um, um, you know, be a good daughter. And then I make all plan already. I'm, I'm getting ready to go out uh, for the last time. I receive a phone call from an insurance agent. His name is Steve. I don't know him. He said that uh, I heard from so and so that you know you have a baby, and if you buy an insurance policy from me right now, uh, the price is very good. So I said that no, I'm not. I'm not buying insurance. I don't have money to buy insurance, and I want to put down the phone. And uh, he said, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. He said that, uh, you know, my church uh, has some um, evangelistic meeting. There's a special speaker coming. Can I invite you to a church? Church was a foreign to me because uh, my whole life, I've never stepped into the church. Before I said no, I remember that, hey, I want to go to Orchard Road. It's very troublesome for me to carry baby, bring pampers, uh, bring milk powder and all that and uh, go to go out and because uh, I'm not familiar with Singapore. yeah. And I said to him uh, uh, the strange uh, answer, I said that if you can bring me to Orchard Road, okay, either before or after your service, okay, I'll, I'll go with you. <laughs> I never expect him to say yes, but then he said, yes, I'll come and get you because my church is... is uh, slightly off uh, Orchard Road. So he came with his wife. He, he picked me up and then he sent me to a, a, a church. And I was seated at the last third row from the back, holding on to a baby. And uh, this man that brought me uh, to the church with his wife, uh, they just put me there and then they just disappear. I don't know where they are. And it's an uh, English service. I don't understand English. It's the first time in my entire life that I step into a church that I do not understand. I don't understand the language. They were singing in English, I don't understand. The pastor was preaching in English that I don't understand a single word. The, throughout the entire service, I only focus on one, one thing. It's very painful here. I couldn't breathe. When is this going to end? Because I just want to go out and I just want to end my life. Until um, 
At the end of uh, service, the speaker asked, uh, is there anyone that want to come forward to get the prayer? I didn't even know. But up from the stage, the preacher was pointing at me and said, that woman, that woman with a baby, I want you to come forward. I just came from the left and from the right and asked me to go out. I said, go out, go out, you know, the preacher is calling you. I went out carrying the Joel. They were trying to translate uh, uh, in Hokkien uh, to me. And uh, the preacher was asking me, he said, do you want to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? My answer is, who is Jesus? I don't know who is Jesus. If he can even get me out of my situation, I saw the whole auditorium was red in color, red, red. And then suddenly, because uh, when I went out, I went out feeling very pain, pain, you know, a lot of pain right here and suffocating. But as I went out and I and I said, who is this Jesus? Suddenly I sensed peace, peace that transcends beyond understanding, peace that I never thought in my entire life exists. I asked, I, I asked them, I don't know who is this Jesus, but if this Jesus that you're talking about equivalent to this peace that I am experiencing, I must have it. I cannot do without it. So I received Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior there and then. I came home. That was the first night that I slept so soundly. And my daughter, for the strangest reason that normally she will wake up every two hours, she also sleep very soundly. So the both of us able to sleep until the next day, nine o'clock. That morning, when I wake up, something happened as I wake up and as I walk to the window. As I look out, how come this world can be so beautiful? You see, nothing has changed at that point of time. The father is still gone. I still don't have money. I still don't have anything. I, I still don't have hope. And I was um, trying to search and search, where is that pain? Where is that pain that I couldn't even breathe? It's gone. Just like that. Nothing has changed externally. But something changed within me. Something changed within here. I picked up the letter that I wrote to my mother and I reacted again. Somehow there is strength from the inside that tells me that, no, I'm not going to die, but I'm going to live. I'm going to live for my daughter. And most important of all, I'm going to live to declare that hey, Jesus said I just knew the night before He can heal and mend my broken heart. After that experience, I decided that hey, I want to uh, restart my life all over again. I picked up the courage to uh, uh, call my mother to tell her all the problem. And I asked her that can you come to Singapore and take care of my daughter so that we can start afresh here in Singapore. I need to go and look for a job. But to look for a job for a foreigner like me, back then, don't speak English, don't know anything. Uh, I only uh, managed to uh, go into a first year university in Indonesia. And then I got married straight away. So in Singapore, my education is not even recognized. I knocked at so many doors and I was rejected. And I thought that what else can I do? You know, maybe I go and sell McDonald's, I go and sell Kentucky. Okay, and again, I went to McDonald's and Kentucky and I was rejected too. So uh, I have to uh, put my resume in a recruitment agent. And then one day the recruitment agency uh, called me and they said that, you know, I was looking through your uh, CV and uh, I found out something that you're good at. Bahasa Indonesia. 
<laughs> the only thing that I was good at, okay, uh, is bahasa Indonesia. So he said that I have an opening for you, okay, and uh, you will have no problem by speaking because uh, all your colleagues, uh, you know, speak uh, Malay. So they put me um, as a security guard. Yeah, so that was my first job. 23 years ago as a security guard earning $2.70 per hour yeah I was there for three months as a security guard uh, and then uh, um, my supervisor looked at me and he said that hey you know uh, why don't I send you for uh, English course so that you can become an uh, operator so they sent me for English course and eventually I became an operator and then after that, uh, the recruitment agency uh, gave me another assignment in another company uh, as an operator. And then uh, from the operator, uh, uh, the recruitment agency again referred me to another company. Okay, This is the construction company that uh, they uh, made me an administrator. And then they sent me for further school. From administrator, I became uh, assistant manager. From assistant manager, I became a uh, manager and then a senior manager. And then uh, after that, uh, I got uh, headhunted to another company. From a senior manager, I became a general manager. And then from a general manager, I became a managing director. Yeah, just within uh, six, years, six years, it was uh, really um, the grace of God. Because uh, if you, if now, if I think back those years, to be honest, I don't know how I went through. I have to work like from 8.30 to 5. And then I have to go to study from 7 to 10. And then um, when I come home, is where the time I take over taking care of Joelle. And Joelle wakes up every two hours for her feeding. And because I don't have uh, enough income, uh, I have to look for supplements. So I bake, I bake cookies, uh, I pack mushroom, I pack uh, hampers um, to have uh, uh, income supplements. And plus, uh, when I uh, study, eventually when the company sent me for management course, I have to do a lot of paperwork. I have to study very hard. I don't know where does all this strength came from. Maybe one, one, one day I only sleep like two hours, three hours. But um, the Lord uh, gave me a verse for me to go through it. He said that in Hebrew 11, 6, He said that without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever that come to Him must believe that He is and He is the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So, when I seek Him and look at Him alone, I have to forego my situation. I have to forego, yes, it's tiring, but instead of complaining, instead of murmuring, instead of being ungrateful, I choose to say that the joy of the Lord is my strength. And that is where I, came. I, I got my strength back all the time without fail. Every time when I felt tired, I would just say that, you know, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And the strength just came. And that keeps me going. I remember uh, I was a human resource manager. As a human resource manager, you need to write a lot of memos, like informing uh, people that, okay, today is public holiday, tomorrow your leave may be, you know, taken this, and then I have to write a lot of memos. The company gave me um, opportunity, knowing that I have, my English is so bad, okay, but uh, not everyone are, are being gracious. And they were a lot of them are doctors, engineers, professional, and all that. And the notice spot is right in the middle of um, a place that everybody every day will walk past. And um, every time when I want to write a memo uh, to put up on the notice board, I was always in tremble because my English was so poor, my grammar is always wrong. And every time when I put out. I will see very soon a red pen, a green pen. They will sometimes they will put a turtle, and then they will make fun of me like um, 
they will put a um, remarks that uh, you know which school do you graduate from I mean everybody in the office will walk past and will look at it and will laugh at me so every time when I collect back those uh, memorandum uh, will be full of remarks and with uh, funny funny cartoons and all that and uh, I will ask myself do I give up I can I, I, I can give up easily every time when I look at that memorandum uh, and uh, when I want to give up I always remember the Lord's promise to me when he gave me Joel 2 25 to 26 he said that I will restore to you all that has been eaten by the locust all the years that the locust has eaten I will restore to you and you will eat in plenty and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and I remember he said this he said that for my people will never be put to shame those who trust in the Lord will never be put to shame so I say that okay I will work even harder and I will turn this adversity into something that will come out good for me doctor say that, that she will not live past three months she live past three months doctor say that in six months at the most she live past six months and doctor say that one year she'll die she never die she asked me to prepare hundred thousand one hundred thousand sing dollar um, for surgery I don't have 100,000 sing at that point of time but I know that I have a big God and I can pray so I prayed I stopped seeing doctor because of not having enough money Joelle was always sick she's uh, so weak that uh, one month she will sick for three weeks and then after that she will get sick again She's so weak that she's not able to walk. She's only started learning to walk at the age of four. That's how she grew up. And then she always have problem um, because she couldn't breathe properly. She will always have problem during uh, feeding, yeah, during milk time. Prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And she got better. I sense that she got better, although I never bring her to see doctor, but just praying and praying. And at the age of six, God say, why not you bring her back to see the doctor and see what the doctor say. I brought her back to see the doctor. They did an ECG on the heart. And they asked me, what did you do to this child? I said, I didn't do anything. He said that it cannot be. He said, you look at the old report, this heart, you know, the three holes in the heart and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's failing, okay. But he said, when you look at the new report, okay, this heart is normal, it's totally perfect. And to them, it is still impossible because as they put the two reports together side by side, the old report and the new report, they say that these two hearts is not connected to each other. And to, to them, from the medical point of view, it is something that is impossible. Possible because they cannot trace back uh, the doctor told me that you know uh, from their medical point of view there's a recovery process every time you know uh, when from there's a hole to become no holes okay so it's like uh, you know closing up they're able to trace he said but in your daughter case we are unable to trace anything because these two heart as they put together is it has got different it's a different set of heart you know, as if that there's a hand that removed the old one and put in the new one, okay? And who can do this kind of miracle? It's only God. So, God heals her heart. And uh, I became greedy. I say that God, if you can heal the heart, you can heal the brain too. At that point of time, Joel was uh, six plus, six years plus, and uh, I need to register her to a primary school. So I say that God, surely you heal the heart, surely you heal the brain too. Because what good is it if she has a perfect heart without a perfect brain? So every day I pray, God, you must heal. You must heal. When are you going to heal? I got no more time. I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and I make my own decision. I say that Joel must be a normal child. 
Okay, she the Lord surely will heal her brain. So I put her in a normal school. So um, the Lord spoke to me, say that, do you think that Joel is a burden to you? I said, of course, yes. You ask any parents who have a special child, it's, it's very burdensome. You don't know what to do to them. Sometimes you want to scold them. You think they don't know, hey, they know. Sometimes you don't, sometimes you scold them, hey, it turns out to me they don't know. The Lord said, what about I say that she's a blessing to you? I said, how can a burden become a blessing? He said that, is it easy to love the lovable? Yeah, but if you are able to love the unlovable, you see already, you don't know how to love. And the love is always come with a question. Why can't you be normal? Yeah, the conditioned love, you know. When you're able to love the unlovable, then the true Christ-like love will be developed in you. He said that what makes you think the world call them special child? The Lord said because they were special in my sight. And I was like, wow, God, you said that they are special in your sight. You don't even call me special in your sight. So I said, okay, Lord, if you say that this child is a blessing, then so be it. From today onwards, I'm going to change my prayer. I'm not going to say that, God, you must heal her. I'm not going to twist your hand to say that, God, if you don't heal her, I'm not going to friend you, but be it unto me according to your will. If today she will be like a thorn on a pole side to me, so that I will cling on to you with that tenacity that I will never let you go, so be it. I took Joel out from a normal school. I put her in a special school. I said sorry to her. I say that I am sorry. Mommy is sorry. My mouth, I said, I love you. But in my heart, I have never truly 100% accept you as who you are. But from today onwards, I'm not going to expect you to be like what I wish for or I dream of. But I'm going to just accept you as how the Lord has created you. She cried big time. She cried and cried and cried and cried and, 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 and I thought she didn't know all this world, but they knew, she knew. They have a very sensitive heart. They know who can accept them fully and who is not accepting them fully. And progressively, I saw that she recovered. From there onwards, she excelled. When I put her in a normal school, she's always condemned there. I put her in a special school, she became a school prefect. And then she started learning piano. She started uh, uh, singing and dancing. And, and every now and then, she will tell me things like, Jesus visited me in my dream last night. And uh, she grew and um, she loved God. And uh, she can do things that normal people can do, normal child can do, uh, except academically, uh, she's rich, uh, but the rest of it, she is uh, very good and I am very happy. All the while, I thought that um, my existence is to care for Joel, um, but the Lord reminded me, actually, is Joel is there so that I can fulfill God's purpose in my life.